Okay. It's so nice. So nice to be back. And I'm feeling so much better. Thank you very much for that. I got the energy to do these. I thought, you know, this I'd run my course, but, you know, as far as uh, these videos, I was just tired of doing them. But no, it's, and you guys brought came in with a number of very good comments this time. So I really appreciate that. Um, I want to thank David uh, D. and Benjamin C., Jimmy C. They know who they are. Your recurring donations are <laughs> always, always, always appreciated. And thank you so much. And I hope everybody else out there um, um, appreciates it. I know they do. All right. So let's get on uh, right quickly because we have to get a second video onto one card today. So I'm not trying to shortchange anybody, but I got to move it. So Leanna Matt, and that's another name I don't think I've seen before. By the way, I went, had to go back a month or more into these um, to find these things because I haven't even looked at anything in that period of time. I really took time off. As I said, though, I'm feeling good. so And I'm feeling like being back here doing this again. So very gratifying. I do say, should say something uh, I haven't mentioned again before, but uh, I should mention it again. The, the, um, I did once mention, I'm sorry. but uh, And that is that the um, there is some hope uh, via Ali, um, and by the way, Ali, I don't know. I think this might be your, no, this isn't your wedding day. So if you're actually watching this by some chance when you're about to get married, I really want to wish you the very most beautiful day, you and your and your uh, sweetheart. Um, uh, from, um, from Finland, if, if nobody minds me saying that. But Ali has been talking to... Uh, uh, get me to come over to Europe, and it, if we if I did that, I was thinking that I might do like three two week workshops in three different parts of Europe, uh, you know, including Italy and um, France, England, probably, yeah, maybe something else. Depends on what comes up. I'd love to see the Prado and all that sort of stuff. Um, but in any case, um, have that in mind. I it probably wouldn't be cheap, uh, especially if you're coming from the states. There'd be some. You know, either your own ticket issues or whatever, but um, it is something I would like to do. I'd like to do it, especially for you guys who are my viewers from over that side of the pond. I know there are several of you in Ireland who actually made comments to me about um, about um, on the subject. So here we are, uh, uh, Leon. I'm going to call it Leon. L Leanne? Let's say Leanne. Uh, but not if it's a guy that I'm in trouble. <laughs> All right, Al, <laughs> just finished reading Boston's advice to his daughter and Sargent's advice to his students. This sparked a couple of questions in my head and made me realize that I don't fully understand the importance of flatness in a picture. Why would flat tones be something to aspire to and pursue rather than stay away from? How can someone like Benson or Sargent advise to make flat tones and at the same time expect depth in painting? Did Vermeer use flat tones in the face of the girl with a pearl earring? Does Sargent himself end up with flat tones in the faces of his portraits? They don't seem flat to me. I've read somewhere that painters who then first train to paint from life end up with flat tones, which is certainly what happens with me when I paint from life. But I feel that this is a weakness in my paintings, not a strength. What am I missing? Good one. Good question. Really delightful one. Um, and I think the right thing to do is just jump into pictures. Oh, well, maybe I'll do, I'm going to set a picture up here and then I'm going to um, just talk about flatness. But flatness has multiple meanings and uses and it doesn't necessarily, and, 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 and some people have argued that paintings should appear flat. But obviously paintings don't appear flat. They appear 3D at times. They shouldn't appear Trump 3D, like it shouldn't like look like something sticking out past the frame as, oh, I want to say even Rembrandt was trying to do at one point, painting over the edge of a frame. <laughs> the fool of the eye, Trump is a word for fool of the eye uh, painting. That's not what, you're not trying to create a 3D world in painting, but your paper, the value relationships, the edge relations, they produce a sense of the third dimension. And you certainly aren't resisting it because it's part of the general impression. So if anybody's saying flatness, I want you to think about whether which of three things it might mean. That first one being 
should the painting be simply look flat? And should we be talking about a frieze? I think Ang at one point argues that paintings should be nothing more than a frieze. That they shouldn't, if somebody said you shouldn't be able to walk around in a painting, shouldn't be able to breathe in it. That's a conversation. And I, I, I'd certainly suggest to you that I don't think it's a brilliant on anybody's part to make that your goal, to make it look like you could walk around in a painting. I do feel like the Trump guys are doing that. You know, <laughs> their, their sense of reality or realism, that sort of thing, sort of goes against the very nature of a, of a, of a board, you know, a flat screen with data on it, which is supposed to be enjoyable to look upon as such rather than simply being something where you're going in and, and being a substitute for realism, you know. Um, so, but that's one version of flat, though, that's out there. And you can see the one on the right, and the one by um, uh, uh, Sargent has an element of that look, doesn't it? And on the one on the left, it actually looks very, very deep. And, pro and, in, and in nature, it looks even deeper. The A um, lot of the values uh, uh, and effects and that sort of thing in the background look like they're weakened in this interpretation. This isn't a big, particularly big picture, if my memory serves me. I, I'm pretty sure I've seen this one. I don't know if that's the Mets or whose that is. If I haven't seen this one, I've seen one very like it. But his whole goal is to paint that phenomena. But that phenomena, meaning that deep world, and be able to paint anything. Paint a deep, that's, well, didn't you see Velasquez doing the same thing, you know, in those two big pictures? He's actually trying to give us a, 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 a world of that isn't just this thing right here. But he's trying to talk about the whole body of data at once, you know, and of the visual impression. And um, so if you don't get the sense of the third dimension, you're failing at your job of, 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 as an impressionist of getting your note relationships right, because that's what creates that, third, that thing. So size relationships and so on. However, <laughs> there are two other ways of using flat, and both of them are methodological. Uh, one of them says that when you're painting, see the world in front of you as if it were on the picture plane already, as if it were already a painting. In other words, as if it were already 2D. That is a, one of the words for flat, right? It's a flat screen. Your canvas is flat. So if you're talking that flat, you've got to learn to do that. You've got to learn to look at the thing in front of you and not see depth. Because you can't paint depth. You can just paint color values, right? There's no depth on your palette. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so all you can paint is this to this and that to that of a body of, of a of a of a of a um, ensemble of effects, color values, et cetera, et cetera. Also, all you can do is organize those things, get them the right size, shape, and and so on. Value, and um, so that. But that's a very important P component to actually doing effectively, be, to doing very effective painting from life. But if you paint values right, as I said before, that doesn't mean it's going to be a flat picture because you did that, okay? Now, the conversation that you get to, I tell you, I saw a conversation uh, somebody has put out recently, one of the, one of the, one of the people uh, of our time celebrating, and by the way, I didn't put names on these pictures. I don't think I did on any of them in this one. Apologies. Uh, um, but um, that person is using, is saying, is putting words in Sar Sergeant's mouth over and over. Fat means this, flat means that, flat means this, flat means that. And, and you know, I want, I want those things I highly recommend is you never read what people say or somebody else is saying. If it isn't in their own words, I wouldn't go there. You can listen for a second if somebody's, but you don't have context. There's all kinds of problems with listening to what people are saying. But there's this whole conversation about Sergeant and Flat. It's made up as far as I'm concerned. There's, I, I don't think I've seen two quotes by Sergeant. So now, and yeah, nevertheless, and these picture, the picture on the left does not, doesn't even begin to look like it's one dimensional, right? Or, or whatever, two dimensional, flat. It doesn't look flat. However, if you want to, when you're making pictures, you have to see, and this is Benson talking now. Did I actually share that quote here? Yeah, well, let me just look at these because you mentioned this one. So what does flat mean in this picture? Is he flat or is he round or what's the opposite of flat even? If you're saying flat means that. By the way, flat also means not shiny. <laughs> you know, paint, flat paint on your walls, <laughs> satin paint, shiny, paint, uh, high gloss, you know, it's not glossy. That flat also means that. So be thoughtful about what somebody might be meaning with all these things. 
But there, I'm just, I'll, that's just there in case we want to refer to it. You mentioned the Pearl Earring. And I, by the way, these two by uh, um, uh, Vermeer also, the one on the right looks way flatter in a certain sense, right? It almost feels like paper cutouts. The, um, the, um, the area around, you know, this looks like it's been cut out. So, so it's to, but the cloth will do that, right? But this guy looks like he's cut out. Right, so, so you got these layers of flat, patterny things, almost like a, a, a Disney cartoon technology, and that's a thing that that actually can can be achieved via outline making strategies. But, um, but he's inherently flat. Now we talk about flat, and we mean flat shadows. Shadows are flat, as flat as a hat. They're flatter than that. We mean that the the form is not in the shadows. These areas are for atmosphere. So this kind of stuff here, and that's one of the that's one of the ideas that we mean by flatness. We mean one value, one continuous value, with very little. And that always means with very little, by the way. There's the fact that this, 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 if you blur your eye a little bit, and it's so huge that what I'm about to tell you, you learn to see by blurring your eye. So, but it's not in this discussion, it's in a different one. I'm going to come back to the other sergeants and things in a minute. Um, so, so if you're thinking, if you're thinking in the like I did talking about in the last video, that about patterns in the in the, in the what some people like to call the graphic arts, meaning poster arts or something like that, this is very postery, right? I mean, this little group here feels like it's got form, three dimensions, even the parts do, but the general design of this picture is postery. There's no question about that, and that's a thing, right? But it's not a we don't he doesn't Sargent doesn't set out to do postery pictures, right? Does he? And he doesn't become that more and more with time. Some settings set that up for you and that you say to yourself, oh, I see where I am. That's one of the, this is one of those days, like when you start to suddenly see all the pieces on the chessboard, you realize you're in that, you're in that kind of a, of a frame and you better make the right moves. Well, this is happening, you know, so if you look out there, you blur your eye a little bit and you can't see anything. It's all blurry, basically, except these lines are just going, pick, 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 pick. make the best of it, right? The job isn't realism. Your job is to find what makes the magic pictorial, right? But in his methodology, so in a, it's partly, a, it feels like a watercolor methodology a little bit when they say flat. So you, when you do watercolor, you don't really do much by way of, 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 of smooth turning. That's the beauty of, of uh, oil paint. But watercolors, they tend to be uh, less forgiving that way, less easy to do that way. Um, but what, you're, what you'll see here, if you blur your eyes a little bit, is you'll see a big value here into which the guy has broken these darks, right? He's broken these darks into this flat value. Now, when I say flat, do I mean flat? Like, like it has to be horizontal and smooth? <laughs> or do I simply mean that it's generally one color, one color value? And I don't mean color, I do mean value. So what you're seeing in the background here is basically one value, and it, you might have, and it might have been essentially put down flat. And I'll talk about Benson in a second, show you a picture with his. But, but then there he breaks into it with both darks and lights if he can. And sometimes you'll see him scraping another watercolor, scraping actually literally scraping paint off to get white back, <laughs> or else other times using opaque whites on it. I'm trying to scrape it off with a razor blade. We did that stuff. I mean, I was a high school kid. I did have one guy that I worked with uh, as a teacher that that really enjoyed uh, watercolor and, and had us playing around with various of these kinds of uh, wonderful things, uh, including, you know, the, the, the liquid uh, um, gum or whatever you paint on, just so no paint will cover that spot and then you peel it off later. Sargent did things like that. Uh, but if you can follow what I mean, though, but if you can see that strategically, you might think of this as one big value, and then you'll say, now what do I need to articulate in it, and where would I start with that? Well, you'd start with these guys here that breaks up this big value, or this, or, or these other spots. They begin to be, and that's in the nature of how watercolor works. And I suggest to you that when Sargent is saying work from the middle tones, a significant part of what he may mean is this whole thing here being that tone. And I say middle tone, meaning, so this thing has its own middle tone, but then it's got darker darks and lighter lights on both ends of that general tonality, right? You heard Meldrum talking about this as well, the general value. Um, he said, what is the value of a checkerboard, right? And here's blacks and whites. What's the general value of that? <laughs> but to, but, and it'll do things if you look at some of those um, full the eye kinds of books. Um, so now, flatness, 
Um, I'm going to go back to what I was just talking about. In fact, maybe I should do it first. Yeah, let's do let's do um, uh, Benson in the same way, because Benson is this other conversation. So what did he mean by flatness? Um, so in this case here, you can see that his design is a two-dimensional design. Now you can say, oh, it all looks like it's going back into here. Yeah, it does look like it's doing that because the angles suggest perspective and all that sort of stuff. But in fact, the beauty of the pattern is two-dimensional. Its beauty, in, its beauty is two-dimensional. And yours, your thinking, wants the beauty has to be, as it were, on a flat plane if, of the play of things this way. It's not about the play of things. In. It actually is about the play of things this way. That's the energy. That's the beauty of that. It's a design in a square. It's a design of spots in a square. Distribution of spots in a square. And so it has to be. You have to be able to see it as if it were. You have to see it on its own terms. How about that? It, paintings aren't three dimensional, and their beauty is not primarily because of some three dimensional thing they do. It's the beauty of the distribution of spots. So this whole oozing together into that point there. It's doing it flat. It doesn't need, we don't need to have, know how many feet back that is to that uh, tree group or whatever that is in the distance there, et cetera. And by the way, you're talking about a guy here who is perfectly capable of making a three-dimensional looking picture. But watch out, does he, and in the next image I'll show you, um, he's going, you're gonna see that he's paint, would paint an area like this, as it were, flat, right? It's a value unit thing, as it were flat. I mean, understand that it's, Flat is, in any case, it's an exaggeration or a false, it's, a, it's an equivalent thing. It's not a real thing. It's flat, for a lot of people, flat means smoothed out even. I mean, he does not do that, right? I mean, look at this, look at this stuff here. Now, well, okay, so let's look at, look at the starts. Uh, I'll come back to mine in a second, but Benson says, lay the, value, lay the values in flat. This is the lay-in, lay the values in flat. You haven't painted long enough to know what flatness means. Whew. It's the most valuable quality there is. You see a mere breadth of difference in value when you put in all, you, honey, <laughs> daughter, you see a mere breadth of difference in value and you put in all sorts of changes and modulations. What is he really saying there? He's saying, don't go into the third level of information. Just give me the big impression, the big notes. So his start, and by the way, the sergeant on the left. But what you can see here is exactly what he says to do. This is a big, flat note. That's what flat looks like, apart from these things, that, these, these, these things here that come in a minute later or sometime later. And so this is a big, flat note. You see the unity of that behind it, going right up even into the hair and even whatever you want to say about it, right? It's so valuable to see things that way. And sergeant says, see it in three or four values. A meaning planes of value, but planes is the wrong word. It's just literally three or four values. But you can see that this is a different one, wholly its own color, its own value, and uh, and chroma. So do you see what I'm saying? This could be said to be like three basic values, and you'd lay them in big and flat as you could. And when it didn't quite work out to look like the big impression, you'd make adjustments. This, you, you, you know, the putting this in flat, you know, you learn right quick to put this in big. I think as big is a better word than flat put it in in the greatest ramifications, including a bit about a roll over here, but not so much that you're drawing her hip. <laughs> so that it's flat, it's a flat unit, but it's a, but it's a trans transitioning unit. I mean, it never, what's the point of making this a white cutout when you know it's not, it doesn't have, a, when it has a lost area, basically a lost joint down there. But, um, so you wouldn't necessarily cut it out like this, but he, so he's not telling you to cut it out like that. Now, he all, but he does say something specific about flat. He says, paint two flat values side by side when you're trying to get the edge. So you're really trying to get the effect. He's telling you to get this thing here right there and this note right here to be absolute values, not goofed up a little messy things that are both this and that and this and that. Make them one value. That's all it means by flat. Make it a, but, but a stroke of a brush, if you think about it, a stroke of a paintbrush is flat. You're going to put his stroke down, it's going to be flat, unless you dicker with it. Right? <laughs> mm. This is good. Somebody stuck a cinnamon in my coffee today. And a hint of chocolate. <laughs> I'm living it up. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, you follow, though, that this is so big a deal. But in this case here, it just happens that 
the note looks flat. It's not busy. This is broken, but this is still flat, okay? So don't misunderstand that idea. And by the way, the beauty of this picture is in what the design was as if it were just two-dimensional, okay? Now, I can tell you all day that there are beautiful designs. Like you could say that this design also might, you might say that this feels like it's going in to the picture. <laughs> good, lovely. But that illusion is all on a flat plane. And if it's not good looking and it's just pure spotting and distribution of spots as if it were, and you don't even know what anything is, and about, you don't even know about in. If it's not good then, it's not good, right? Okay, and that's sort of the very next. Now here's Sargent doing exactly the same thing. This is flat. Sorry, that's flat. There's three flat notes. This one, this one, and this one. If you want to say there's a fourth one. But those are what I would call flat notes. Don't make them, don't make more out of flat than that. But, and I am always telling students, but don't mean to think that that means there's no color movement in it. Just maintain the unity of the value. So this, the, and you have to look at your paintings and understand them valuistically. You say, what is this picture? For example, this picture is a, uh, let me, let me actually talk about a different one. Uh, like, let me, so what is this picture, right? This is a light picture with dark flecks on it, right? By the way, this is Benson doing exactly the same thing. This is flat. <laughs> this is flat. This is flat. Even though it's broken, it's flat, okay? You can see that this dark up here, as it were, is one big note. It's understood as a, as a single dark, rather. In a, so the mentality is to grasp it in the unity it has as a value, so it's this big old shape or pattern or whatever it is, is value X. And then you can see behind it or underlying everything not behind in nature necessarily is this other green all through here, middle old, this middle old green sitting in there. And then there's a sky at a whole different value, right? Now, flat is a mentality, isn't it? <laughs> so, it, it, so it largely means unity of a value, how, you know, so, the, so the, this is one unit, this is one unit, or you could say maybe this one unit is all tied to this one as a value unit. And to, for you to grasp that is very valuable, very useful. So oh, I don't know what else I would say to you about that one, but let's go back to the, um, to the, um, um, this one. This one is me, I did a demonstration, and this is a lay-in. Now, this girl isn't, isn't flat, but the note essentially is flat because that's all I needed for right now. This is curled up papers. It's not flat, but the note's flat, meaning it's one note. And like this whole area is basically one, and this dark here is all basically one big thing picking up over here and all that sort of stuff. That's a grasp of the, of the, of the greater value unit and the way it hangs together. So that's what we mean by flat. That's what we mean by flat. You guys who want to interpret what Sargent might mean or three other guys might mean by it, it's all up to you, but or what you do yourself, and you use the word flat, but it's one of the difficulties of our world. It's not primarily a, you know, verbally well um, um, clarified, you know, I mean, it's pieces. And I'm doing the best I can with what I have and what I was given, but I sometimes even change my phrasing, you know. Uh, is flat really the right word? But but you can see that what we mean by flat here now, some parts of it imply roundness, but the chair top, this, these are just notes in the hunt for, for major color relations, trying to get up the color scheme. Remember the point that, that Benson makes is that you're trying to cover the canvas in a day. And if you're lost in all sorts of littlenesses in through here, like what you might see in this area of this, if this photograph was what I was making, if you start getting caught in any of this multiplicity of things, you'll not get the canvas covered sanely and soundly and accurately and, and, and usefully by the end of the first day. You won't have a good color scheme. It'll just be, you'll be lost in the myriad of subplot. So you think of things, even this area might be thought of as value X, but not because of the whites, right? The whites are different. But, but the value of this is seen as one. This is one big value unit, right? This thing here, you don't go looking in and trying to find all this stuff. You can find this whole dark here, going all the way down through here, has this, even, even to this fingering out into here, can be perceived as a flatness in a very patternistic way. And you can see that it feels patterny on that left thing, but in a very patternistic way, as much as you see there. But, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get back to this pattern thing. But as, even as much as you see here, this is just the down. See this big white here? I sh I've talked about that in, the, in some of the other uh, shows about composition, especially regarding Degas. But <clears throat> this is a big white. This is a second size white. And there are other size masses of whites. 
but there's a distribution, a spot distribution, an interest difference, all that sort of stuff. There's a, but there's a great play of the great white pattern on this two-dimensional plane, right? And the dark is a sub-pattern set, right? So there's a three-value system here. So in one sense, it's flat, and that's something I don't, I won't tell anybody that's not what they're doing. This is postery, as some of you would say, graphic art. So I don't know if I've said enough or I've said it all. Maybe I'll have to go back to the quote like I usually do. But let's just look at the Greek phase, though, just to talk about the value of flat, though. Because, I mean, of pattern. Because that's, don't ever underestimate how important that is when it does happen. You really want it. You want to take advantage of it. But these these things are are not modeled. Everything is cut out. The nearest thing to modeling is suggested because there's lines in the dress. But it's black lines on white or it's or it's black lines on red. But what you can see they're doing is getting this massive entertainment value out of the pattern. And this is what I, you know, Gamble would refer to that as a pattern, that term he used. Pattern can mean many other things. Uh, but if you can follow that, you can even see in a set of a main line, this sort of a movement like this. You see that? This is a, this is a very well-designed abstraction on here. But it's just a pattern. And the fun is in the interplay of patterns. You'll see how cautious, how carefully they are careful they are to make the dark units, what some people call negative shapes, different in size and shape from all the other ones. You see that? Dinky little one, next size, next size. They all, you know, there's all different sizes all through here. And they're games that they play and they're very entertaining in their abstractions as much as this light is entertaining on the dark. So never neglect that part of painting. And that, but that is something you comprehend better uh, when you don't see three-dimensionally. You want to get yourself to the point where you can grasp what a painting is patternistically, that is, say, flat. I think I left something out that I wanted to go back to, and I don't think I'm going to remember what it is. <laughs> you can see how the both of these paintings would be seen. This is very simple. If you blur your eyes again, you'll see this dark head here. This is part of this big, dark, flat, dark. It's a flat, dark. That's what we think of as a flat, dark, right? Is it flat? Yeah, in a sense, yeah. It's not great for me, you know, it's not, it's not making big roundies and stuff. And of course that's atmospheric shadow too, so we think of that as flat. But look at how when you're laying this in, you would have just had color movements and this would have been all one value of, I mean, basically a, maybe a light to less light movement of light, still thought of as flat, but you'd have color movements in it. So in one sense, so what's happening is that the back of this girl is being set off against this one by both coolness to warmness, shall we say, and there's hint of some little bit of readability from time to time. But you do, don't wind up with the thing looking flat, do you? So this overlapping thing is a pretty significant thing. Um, no question it is. Sargent's the guy that talks about, though, making your picture with just a handful of values. So uh, you can think of this, maybe this one here is a two or three value system. So you can, if you want to think about it the same way, go feel free. But you can see the darks here being thoroughly tied to the dark world. There's a patternistic thing going on. I would suggest maybe there's a middle tone thing going on, but your job isn't to go and try to force those into the world as much as to notice them and see whether when you're making a picture, you have the unity of the values. Do, they, do the values that are like each other, do they hang together and have you seen what they're up to in a set? That's why I talk and think about this kind of stuff. So I think I've done my job here. Um, I might come back to that one on the right. I've always delighted in there. I think that is a painting of Woodbury, uh, an, a, an American painter. Probably a scene up in maybe New Hampshire, Maine. Um, but think about what I'm saying and look at these yourself, right? There are things that happen in paintings that are very interesting. Like this picture could be said to be a big flat mass of dark going into here and breaking up into other spots of dark. A big old middle tone going over here and maybe spotting into somewhat middle tone spots too, right? And that seems to be the underlying structure. And then there's these whites making a pattern on that whole plane, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's so many, um, there's so many um, useful reasons to see the thing as two-dimensionally. As I said, to repeat though, the beginning one is see the world as if it were already a painting. And you only have to deal with what's happening left to right up and down or on angles on, a, on this plane. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty, that, that's a delivery system. It really delivers the goods. So never neglect that flat that way. But you can see that that doesn't mean your painting is going to wind up flat. It should not wind up flat. 
Now, if you work that way and you're very, very strong about that, this also is what we call, and you'd see it in places like this, in the Boston School, you refer to that as the big smash of light. And that's a kind of a, you know, it's, it might be better just to say the big light, <laughs> right? The big dark, or whatever other, you know, however you want to think about the other tones. Do you see what I mean? But, <laughs> but the big smash of light just means you're not getting into this complex world uh, because it's playing a game for you, pattern, pattern, light, light distribution, like this stuff here is all playing to this or whatever. So, yeah. I don't know if there's more I can say about this, but you're, you're into so much fun by starting to think this way. But don't think simplistically about flat. Um, this isn't flat per se. You can see all that activity in there. In the case of when Benson's talking about it, though, you'd probably put it down with some loosey goosiness just to get the combinations of this general impression and give me that value there and set this guy off from it. And later in the game, as you have time in the day, as you are gotten past these very important bits of drawing, you know, the things that really set up the abstraction as a pattern of lights in a dark, as you're getting those really well resolved, you know, there might be a little extra time. And at some point later in the day, you'll get into the subplot with the, the stuff that's happening inside. And so inside, as it were, the big smash or the big, the big shadows. You might get into reflected lights, as it were, in some cases. So let me see what else you might have said here that I might be overlooking. I think this is it. Um, uh, Leanna Matt. Uh, yeah. You did ask a specific question. Did Vermeer use flat tones in the face of the girl with the pearl earring? It does look like he did, right? Uh, Overmodeling is the opposite of that. And what most what people will frequently do, because that might be a good one to end on, what people will frequently do if they don't want to see things as the, in their biggest ramifications, what's the big note here? And by the way, it might be useful to even think about the big note here with the color movement in it, because it's so, if you blow your eyes, it's so clearly a note of its own, differentiated from all the darks all through here, right? And yet it does subdivide. But yeah, it does look like he painted flat. I mean, in that same sense as we mean it, he painted to the broadest specifications of the, of the value area. But you can see this is actually slightly darker here and it's moving in a round way. But he's certainly, if anything, understating the drawing, understating the modeling. He's not over modeling. And you might want to use that word. I don't have anything to give you as a bad example. Most people, most of us as students are over modeling all the time. We're trying to force, we're trying to, we're seeing things at, that are modest. We're seeing and out of, we're seeing them out of their unity. So you might be talking about uh, a value like this and you'll overstate it. Or you might be seeing things in here that you, or even that line right there, and you'll make the value too strong, and it'll destroy, it'll destroy the unity of the of the of, of, of what this does to this. Okay. Best I can do, guys. And I, boy, I'm, <laughs> I've done something exactly like last week. Again, thank you, um, uh, you you three. Let me see if I can find your names to read here: David Deed, Benjamin C, and Jimmy C. Thank you for your ongoing support. Hugely appreciate it. Um, yeah, I hope you all have a very good week. Um, and um, I'll let you know, Mr. Producer's out of town, so I've done two videos in a row today. <laughs> you didn't, you wouldn't need to know that, but it's just part of the amusement of you. You should know a little bit about what I do because it's kind of amusing. All right, so yeah, take care. And we'll see you when Mr. Producer gets back from Ollie's weddings.